be okay this morning. Uh, in our text this morning, we're studying the Gospel of John, as many of you know, and if you're visiting with us this morning, again, we, we teach uh, expositorily through the Bible, and we teach consistent exposition, and so uh, the goal of, of uh, a sermon is to draw out the major meaning of that passage of Scripture, and we do that uh, as we trace our way through the books of the Bible, and so we're currently in the Gospel of John in John chapter 4, and we're kind of right in the middle of this narrative about, um, or this interaction between Jesus and this Samaritan woman, and so the Samaritan woman of chapter 4. So this morning we're going to look at the second half of that story. So in our text this morning, we're going to see the ministry of Jesus in what I'm going to kind of say is three portraits and with three people, the Samaritan woman, uh, the disciples and the Samaritans, three people or three, gr three groups of people. And we're going to see that in all of these, there's a common theme uh, this morning, and that common theme is faith. So faith, we might say, is the theme of our message this morning. Therefore, it's from these three portraits that we're going to learn something about being faithful and something about becoming faithful. We might say it this way, and this is kind of our thesis for this morning's message. We'll see three portraits that reveal three principles of our faith. And so that's what we're going to pursue this, in this morning's message. My plan is to kind of work through these portraits. We'll work through the text, we'll work through these portraits, and then at the end, kind of draw three principles or a single principle from each of these portraits so you know kind of where we're going this, in this morning's me message. Now again, if you're visiting with us, our habit here at Rosedale Bible Church is to stand for the reading of God's Word. And so if you would please stand and we'll read our passage of this for this morning. And it's John chapter 4, verses 27 through 42. John 4, verses 27 through 42. Just then, his disciples came back. They marveled that he was talking with a woman. But no one said... What do you seek, or why are you talking with her? So the woman left her water jar and went away into town and said to the people, Come, see a man who told me all that I ever did. Can this be the Christ? They went out of the town and were coming to him. Meanwhile, the disciples were urging him, saying, Rabbi, eat. But he said to them, I have food to eat that you do not know about. So the disciples said to one another, Has anyone brought him something to eat? Jesus said to them, My food is to do the will of him who sent me and to accomplish his work. Do you not say, There are yet four months, then comes the harvest? Look, I tell you, lift up your eyes and see that the fields are white for harvest. Already the one who reaps is receiving wages and gathering fruit for eternal life, so that sower and reaper may rejoice together." For here the saying holds true, one sows and another reaps. I sent you to reap that for which you did not labor. Others have labored, and you have entered into their labor. Many Samaritans from that time, that town, excuse me, believed in him because of the woman's testimony. He told me all that I ever did. So when the Samaritans came to him, they asked, they really urged him, to stay with them, and he stayed there two days and many more believed because of his word. They said to the woman, it is no longer, they said to the woman, it is no longer because of what you said that we believe, for we have heard for ourselves, and we know that this is indeed the Savior of the world. May God bless the reading of his word. You may be seated. So the Samaritan woman will give us our first portrait of faith, the Samaritan woman. Last week, we looked at this interaction between Jesus and this woman from Samaria. The two met near a well outside of a town called Sychar, and it was at that time Jesus came upon this well that a woman came out from the town to draw water. Now, you remember, Jesus was wearied from his journey, and he asked the woman, give me a drink. He asked for a drink of water. It was this question that would eventually spark the woman's faith. As Jesus and the woman interact, the sparks of faith fly. Yet we discover in verse 29 what actually forged her faith. Come, see a man who told me all that I ever did. 
It was the exposure of sin that exposed her faith. It was Jesus' ability to see her for all that she was that would lead her to ask, come, can this be the Christ? Verse 29. Verse 27 tells us that as the disciples returned from buying food, well, they were, you might say, put off by the fact that Jesus was speaking with a woman, a Samaritan woman, no less. We explored that a little bit last week. Bible Bible commentators give us a lot of insight into the treatment of women uh, in Jesus' day, and as you might suspect, it's not all that encouraging. Uh, The rabbis had uh, many things that they would say about women, and apparently it was faux pas for a man to speak with a woman in public. Jewish rabbis taught, quote, A man shall not be alone with a woman in an inn, not even with his sister or his daughter, on account of what men may think. And more importantly, a man shall not talk with a woman in the street, not even with his own wife, especially not with another woman on account of what men may say. This is kind of the opinion of the day as it regards rabbis and women. Now, we don't have any way of really knowing what the disciples thought about all of this, uh, but verse 27 does imply that these Jewish rabbis may have had some impression on them, although they didn't have the courage to really say anything to Jesus about this. Um, Conversely, these Jewish rabbis hadn't really made any impression on Jesus at all. And so, we see and we learned last week that Jesus speaks to a woman. He takes a risk, you might say. He reaches out. He has not, no problem knocking over those cultural and social barriers that separate people. Of course, he knows the truth. Now, the actions of Jesus uh, lay the teachings of the rabbis to bed. Any notion that a woman is substandard, well, is itself substandard. Although this passage is not primarily about firm, affirming a woman's worth, I mean, that's not really what this is all about. Um, It's compelling that John does use a Samaritan woman as a positive example of faith. And you think about what's all around this Samaritan woman. I mean, we have in John 3, we have Nicodemus, and then we have John's disciples, and then here we have uh, Jesus' disciples, all of which are men, right? And so she is pitted against all of these men around her, and you might say that this Samaritan woman is, becomes a kind of trailblazer. Now, the sense of verse 28 is that as soon as the disciples arrive, this woman, she turns immediately to return to the town. It's a quick scene change, you might say. She does this so quickly, in fact, that she leaves her water jar. She left it there. Now, there are a number of reasons uh, why she might have done this. It doesn't tell, John doesn't give us, you know, details about why she left, but he does include this fact that she left her water jar. It may have been that Jesus and his disciples were using that water jar, and so, you know, they were, it was in use and she couldn't take it with her. It may also be that John is trying to say something about the woman, teach us something about this woman and about what it means to respond to Jesus. It's possible. The fact that John does include this detail does seem to suggest there's something here for us to learn something for us to take away. Can't be certain. I like to think this detail reinforces both her eagerness to share the news of Jesus and her intent to return. At the same time, she's eager to share, yet she's resolved to return to receive her water jar back. Upon returning to the village, the woman offers a kind of exaggeration. She says, Come, see a man who told me all that I ever did. It's a little bit of an exaggeration. I'm not sure Jesus told her all she ever did. But she's staggered. And why is she staggered? Well, she's staggered because Jesus sees into her heart. This is what staggered the psalmist. You recall Psalm 139, verses 1 through 4, that famous, these famous words from David. He says, O Lord, you have searched me and known me. You know when I sit down and when I rise up. You discern my thoughts from afar. You search out my path and my lying down. You are acquainted with all my ways. Even before a word is on my tongue, behold, O O Lord, you know it all together. At the close of a sermon delivered by Charles Spurgeon, a young girl whispered to her mother, how does he know what goes on in our house? 
Barclay writes, there are no wrappings and disguises which are proof against the gaze of Christ. In other words, there's no mask that can shield his gaze. The gaze of Christ sees all the deceit and sickness that lies in the heart. It's striking, yet, and this story draws this out, the gaze of Christ also sees what I'd like to say is the sleeping hero in the soul. Jesus saw a sleeping hero in Peter, you might recall. Peter denied Christ three times. Yet what did Jesus say to Peter at the end of the book of John? Feed my sheep. Turn to the opening book of Acts, the opening chapters of Acts, and who, who's the one who's really leading the beginning of the church? It's Peter. Peter Jesus saw a sleeping hero in Peter, but he also see one in, saw one in Paul. Remember Acts 9.1, we read about Paul. He was breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord. Yet we read in the same chapter, verse 15, that Paul was a chosen instrument of the Lord to carry Christ's name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. And certainly he did all that. Jesus saw a sleeping hero in Timothy. Maybe you remember those words written to Timothy. Paul exhorted him to fan into flame the gift of God. For God gave us not a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of self-control. young man who would stand for, for Paul in Ephesus needed these things. Peter, Paul, Timothy. How about an outcast woman of Samaria? Our Lord sees the sickness that lies within, but He also sees the health that comes when the sickness is removed. Isn't this what Paul spoke of in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 through 5? You recall these words, and you were dead in your trespasses and sins in which you once walked. I love the past tense nature of all of this following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, like the rest of mankind. But God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love with which He loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ." Now he goes on in verse 10, for we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand, beforehand that we should walk in them. As it turns out, our Lord had forged a sleeping hero in the Samaritan woman, and I believe he has forged that in all of us. The Samaritan woman gives us a portrait of this Christian reality. There's a version of the Christian faith that strikes a minor key, we might say. It draws our attention to the concepts of confession and repentance, all necessary. There's another version of the Christian faith that strikes, we might say, a major key. It draws our attention to the concepts of forgiveness and renewal. In, a, in one version, confession and repentance are in the foreground. In another version, forgiveness and renewal are foremost. You might say we fall off the log on either side, or the horse, whatever you want, either way. In the Samaritan woman, we see a true portrait of Christianity. The minor and the major key must stand together. Christianity is at once about confession and repentance, and at the same time about forgiveness and renewal. If Christianity were a song, we might sing the minor key in the verses and the major key in the choruses. How else can we take these words from the Samaritan woman? Come, see a man who told me all that I ever did. Well, how in the world is that good news? That sounds like horrible news. If, th if this is all there is, then Jesus is like a principal. He's like a schoolmaster. He calls us into his office and he reprimands us for all that we've done. 
And as the, the, the attack comes against us, we just slump in our chair. We have nowhere to go. But the woman continues, can this be the Christ? There it is. With this question, we learn that Jesus is not an overbearing principle. It's not the full story. He's a Savior, Messiah. As I see it, Christianity is the only religion where both ideas can stand. It's the only one. It's the only religion of divine achievement. All other religions are founded on human accomplishment. Maybe you've heard this quote from John MacArthur. It's a little bit, you, you see it around. It's a good quote. He says this, there are two kinds of religion in the world, those based on human achievement and those based on divine accomplishment. One says you can earn your way to heaven. The other says you must trust in Jesus Christ alone. Divine achievement versus human accomplishment. In any religion, we can discover what we've done. All religions can do that. All of them can declare some measure of right and wrong, some ethical standard. In fact, a religion without any ethics is really not a religion at all. In all the religions of the world, you and I must find pardon in some way through our deeds. In every other religion. The Muslim demands purity. The Buddhist, a mantra. Catholics and Mormons, merit. All these might declare the first sentence, come see a man who told me all that I ever did. But only Christianity can declare, can this be the Christ? Only one religion is fully based from beginning to end on the accomplishment of another. We sang it this morning. As Christians, we, we take everything we've ever done to Jesus where we hear him say, thy strength indeed is small. Child of weakness, watch and pray. Find in me thine all in all. To which we've responded, if we sang this morning, Jesus paid it all. All to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain. What did he do? He washed it white as snow. This is our first portrait. We're given a second portrait in verse 31. As this woman travels out of focus, we listen in on a conversation between Jesus and his disciples. Verse 31. Meanwhile, the disciples were urging him, saying, Rabbi, eat. But he said to them, I have no food to eat that you do not, I have food to eat that you do not know about. So the disciples said to one another, Has anyone brought him something to eat? And Jesus said to them, My food is to do the will of him who sent me and to accomplish his work. Do you not say there are yet four months, then comes the harvest? Look, I tell you, lift up your eyes and see that the fields are white for harvest. Already the one who reaps is receiving wages and gathering fruit for eternal life, so that sower and reaper may rejoice together. For here the saying holds true, one sows and another reaps. I sent you to reap that for which you did not labor. Others have labored, and you have entered into their labor. Recall when the disciples left Jesus, he was wearied from his journey. He was thirsty and he was hungry. Now we see that Jesus is refreshed. He's satisfied. Verses 32 and 34, Jesus equates doing his Father's work with food. The heart of Jesus is so connected to the Father that to do His work is to feed. The metaphor reveals the necessity of the task. We need food to survive. Jesus needs this kind of food to survive. It reminds us of Deuteronomy 8.3. Maybe you remember the temptation of Jesus in Matthew chapter 4. Jesus quotes this verse here. Man does not live by bread alone, but man lives by every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. What is a reminder to us is a reality to Jesus. As Jesus said, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to accomplish his work. Now, I'm not sure what food the disciples returned with, you know, bread and fish, I have no idea. But there was no greater sustenance 
and satisfaction for Jesus than to speak with the Samaritan woman. That was his food. Jesus kind of switches the metaphor in verse 35, and the disciples then come into the foreground. Do you not say there are yet four months, then comes the harvest? Look, I tell you, lift up your eyes and see that the fields are white for harvest. Here Jesus is setting himself in contrast with the disciples. Verse 34 is emphatic. My food, and then verse 35 is emphatic. Do you not say? This is what I do. This is what you're doing. There's a difference. He's contrasting his actions with the actions of the disciples. In this moment, I'm doing the will of the Father. But you say, there's four months, then comes the harvest. Now, it's very possible that as there's a kind of an object lesson here for Jesus, that as he says these words, it's very possible that between this town of Sychar and Jacob's well where they were, that the, the fields planted around him would have been planted in wheat and barley. Maybe they're standing out in an open farmland. That's very possible. And in this case, and in this region, the, the harvest would have come in around April, which, have, which would have put Jesus at the well in December. So if six months, I'm not a farmer, but as I understand this, the, 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 the seed would have been planted in November. So this is two months later. You could imagine there would have been green everywhere. Maybe this is a kind of object lesson here. So Jesus is looking out onto these green fields, and he says, there are yet four months, and then comes the harvest, kind of an object lesson. In which case, Jesus would be using his environment to make the following exhortation. Look, I tell you, look, lift up your eyes and see that the fields are white for harvest. Now, of course, those fields aren't white. And so he's talking about the people that are coming out of that town. It's a metaphor. So these people coming out of the town as a result of the woman's testimony, he's saying there's the harvest. They're the people. Now, there's another interpretation you might take these words, they are yet four months, then comes the harvest, and they could be taken as kind of a proverb of the day. So less of an object lesson and more of just a kind of a proverbial thing that people say, which I think Jesus' words, do you not say, seem to suggest a kind of proverbial saying here. And this proverb is a way of saying, ah, oh, there's no hurry. The seed is planted but there's no way of getting around the, the month, months of waiting. Growth is slow. It takes time. Eh, it's four months and then comes the harvest. I guess it's validating procrastination, maybe. Now I imagine, well, whether an object lesson or a proverb, I mean the point is the same, right? The harvest has begun. That's what Jesus is saying. Look, there it is. And I imagine these words are very striking and, and shocking to the disciples. They're just trying to help him with some food. <laughs> the disciples have come to help Jesus, and in a moment, they're under an admonition, a rebuke, something like that. Like Martha, who was distracted with much serving, the disciples are more concerned with physical food than with spiritual food. They understand how a physical harvest works. But Jesus wants them to understand how a spiritual harvest works. If a physical harvest is bound by time, a spiritual harvest is only bound by effort. If a physical harvest is linear, a spiritual harvest is fluid. The wheat farmer must wait for the crop to go completely white before harvest. There's nothing he can do about it. The spiritual farmer is bound by nothing but his own labor. So Jesus says in verse 36, Already the one who reaps is receiving wages and gathering fruit for eternal life so that the sower and reaper may rejoice together. Where you say there are four months until harvest, already 
someone is receiving payment. And Jesus explains the payment this way. It's gathering fruit for eternal life so that sower and reaper may rejoice together. I don't know about you, but I want to, I want to have joy. I want to rejoice now, up to this point, the sower hasn't been mentioned. It's kind of introduced here. It's new to us. In agriculture, the same farmer who sows the seed usually reaps the harvest. But that's not the case in, a, in spiritual agriculture. It's different. The metaphor breaks down. Look at verse 37. For here the saying holds true. One sows and another reaps. Now, this saying might express the inequality of life. One sows but receives no reward, while another reaps what he's not sown. One sows, another reaps. Jesus, however, I believe, is turning it positive here. One sows and another reaps. Each receives a wage and each rejoices. Jesus brings the sower and the reaper together, which is what the prophet Amos does in chapter 9, verse 13. Looking forward into the future, he sees a time in which the plowman, sh the plowman shall overtake the reaper and the treader of grapes, him who sows the seed. With the coming of Messiah, sowing and reaping are collapsed into one. One kingdom labor, you might say. Now these last words from Jesus are very direct. He turns to them and he says, I sent you to reap that for which you did not labor. Others have labored, and you have entered into their labor. Now, though the action of the reaper and the sower are uh, one kingdom labor, there are distinctions between them, and those distinctions are not removed. Both have work to do. In the case of these disciples, Jesus says that He sent them to reap that for which they didn't labor, meaning, in their case, that others have sown. Who are those others? Well, with the townspeople of Sychar approaching, I believe Jesus is speaking about the sowing that he and the Samaritan woman have done. While these men concerned themselves with earthly matters, Jesus was drawing their attention to spiritual matters. It's possible these disciples thought their time with Jesus would be filled with instruction and training. Maybe they thought being his disciple meant observing his way of life, gleaning his wisdom, meeting his physical needs, which was what disciples did in Jesus' day, which is why they were bringing him food. Yet Jesus, from the beginning, presses them into service. He says, I sent you. Now, as these words fall upon the disciples' ears, well, the labor is among them. It's upon them. Verses 39 through 42, we are given our third and final portrait, and it's a portrait of the Samaritans. The Samaritans. Verse 39, many Samaritans from that town believed in him because of the woman's testimony. He told me all that I ever did. So when the Samaritans came to him, they asked, they urged him to stay with them, and he stayed there two days. And many more believed because of his word. They said to the woman, it is no longer because of what you said that we believe, for we have heard for ourselves, and we know that this is indeed the Savior of the world. Final portrait teaches us a number of things about a spiritual harvest. First, a spiritual harvest begins with an introduction. Someone had to introduce the Samaritans to Jesus didn't just happen. Romans 10, 14 says, how are they to hear without someone preaching? There's a simple reality about becoming a Christian. You and I have to be introduced to Jesus. It's a fairly, fairly simple reality. Someone has to tell us about the Lord. You have to hear about His message and His life. Now, I know it's common You've heard this. It's common to find comfort in these words. Preach the gospel at all times. Use words only when necessary. Have you heard that? Maybe you've heard that. We find kind of some comfort in that, and there's some truth in that. But as a rule, that's wrong. 
Yes, you and I can and should live out the gospel, James 1.22 says. Right? Be doers of the word and not hearers only. Yet, the power to save is not found in our actions, but in the verbal communication of the gospel, the verbal communication of the message of Jesus. The good news is just that, good news. I was thinking about my son this morning who brought in the paper and he went out, you know, I, I didn't have the news. I didn't know what was in the news. My son went outside, he took the newspaper, he brought it in and he slammed it on the counter. Wham! I got the news. He brought the news to me. And I haven't read it yet, but he brought the news to me. That's how I received it. Someone had to bring me the news. It's an account. It's a story. It's a statement. It's a message. And it's one that cannot be delivered unless there's someone to make it. Now, the delivery of that message might come in many ways. In our text this message, we, this morning, we hear the, the words of the Samaritan woman. Come, see a man who told me all that I ever did. Verse 29. In this case, Jesus is introduced through personal testimony. It's a testimony about who Jesus was, what he did, how he, how he talked to her. This woman experienced the power of Christ, and she leads others to that power. Verse 39 again, many Samaritans from that town believed in him because of the woman's testimony. He told me all that I ever did. The spiritual harvest begins with an introduction. Well, it continues with affection. We see this here as well. When the Samaritans were introduced to Christ, they sought his company. They wanted to be with him. It's true that we must be introduced to Christ, but the next step is that we must seek his company. You know the expression, you can lead a horse to water, but what? It's possible to lead someone to the presence of Christ, but after that, he must discover Christ. He must drink from the living waters. In the case of the Samaritans, we see a, a tremendous harvest. Verses 40 again, 40 through 42. So, so when the Samaritans came to him, they asked him to stay with them, and he stayed there two days. And many more believed because of his word. Having been introduced and spending time with the Savior, faith was awakened in the Samaritans. And the woman's testimony became their testimony. Right? Right? It is no longer because of what you said that we believe, for we ourselves, we have heard for ourselves, and we know that this is indeed the Savior of the world. So there's an introduction, there's affection, and then finally we see surrender in this world, in this little phrase, He is the Savior of the world. This was the title given to the Roman Emperor. The Emperor was the Savior of the world. The fact that the Samaritans employed the title affirms they rejected all other means of salvation. In short order, they rejected the notion that salvation could be found in Roman or Greek paganism. And as Gentiles, they came to see Jesus as the Savior of the world. It's a radical statement for its day. The Samaritans understood Jesus was not simply a prophet, his mission was more than sharing a message. While he may have wielded a fiery rebu rebuke and the flame of truth as a prophet, he was more than a prophet. They understood that Jesus was not a psychologist. Certainly, Jesus had amazing insight. He had knowledge of human nature like no one else. He had an uncanny way of seeing into the human mind. Yet he was more than an intellectual or an expert on the psyche. Certainly they took note of his character, yet we understand he didn't come to simply provide a pattern to follow. He didn't come as most teachers do to show us a way to live and then leave us just to demonstrate that. Maybe you remember these famous words from Lewis in Mere Christianity. A man who was merely a man and said the sort of thing Jesus said would not be a great moral teacher. He would either be a lunatic 
I love the way Lewis says this, on the level with a man who says he is a poached egg, or else he would be the devil of hell. You can shut him up for a fool, you can spit at him and kill him as a demon, or you can fall at his feet and call him Lord and God. But let us not come with any patronizing nonsense about his being a human teacher. He has, left that, he has not left that open to us. He did not intend to. End quote. The Samaritans understood Jesus was no mere prophet, no mere psychiatrist, psychologist, no pattern to follow. Jesus was a Savior, and He was the Savior of the world. Jesus rescues us from the evil and hopeless situation in which we find ourselves. He breaks the chains of our past and sets us on a path into the future. This is what Jesus did for the Samaritans. It's what Jesus did for the Samaritan woman. It's what He does for anyone that turns to Him. I suspect these Samaritans might have labeled the woman's character beyond reformation. That's the banner that flies over her head. Beyond reformation. Who could change this woman? She's had five husbands. Five different men. Her life up to this point had demonstrated, only demonstrated a rejection of God. The fact that Jesus came and rescued this woman, that he enabled her to break the chains of her past and opened a new future for her, is profoundly encouraging. And not only that, but he would thrust her immediately into service without, with no delay. She didn't have to go clean up her life to come to him. She didn't have to go clean up her life to be used by him. She was used by him immediately. And so, we have three portraits of faith. The Samaritan woman, the disciples, and the Samaritans. I promised you there'd be three principles from each, and so I'll give you those now, and they will become kind of our closing of this message. Now, obviously, there are pr many principles we might extract from this, and some of them I've already done so, but try to land on kind of one principle for each portrait. So let's work our way back, backwards, and I'll start with the Samaritans. From the Samaritans, we learn that faith is possible. Faith is possible. There's a narrative. You can tell I'm a pretty optimistic guy. I hope you can see that. <laughs> There's a narrative in our day. It's in evangelical circles, and it's in our circle. And it speaks about the abandonment of faith. It's a popular narrative. It's common to write about the ways in which our culture has gone shipwrecked. We read study after study that confirms these findings. Newspapers, magazines, blogs. All of them speak of a popular word in our day, deconstruction. Deconstruction is this idea, it's, it's reevaluating my faith, determining how, you know, the world around me, my upbringing, the things that I was taught by others have influenced what I believe about the Bible and about God. And so I'm going to take, you know, take a step back and I'm going to deconstruct that now. I'm going to rethink it. Now you might, as you might imagine, it doesn't result in greater faith oftentimes. It's a skeptic kind of approach. And usually it leads to, to an unbiblical view of faith or the abandonment of faith, what deconstructing our faith does oftentimes. We read about this, and so on the whole, we've accepted the notion that Christianity, like Rocky, is on the ropes. I know it's an older movie. It's a classic. Well, here's what I think we can learn from the Samaritans. There's never a foundation or an edifice that God cannot break down or tear up. In fact, it seems to me, it's precisely when people begin to shut the doors that Christ breaks in. And what does He declare? Peace be to you. Don't listen to the grim voices that declare our age dead. 
Stop groaning about the uphill task of Christianity. Instead, let's proclaim our day to be a thrilling hour for the Lord. He saved me. He saved you. I love this old quote from an old preaching textbook, 1946. That's old. It's not super old. James Stewart writes in Heralds of God, When a generation has been robbed of its familiar gods of material security, progress, human self-sufficiency, or where the individual soul has found its conventional religion stolen away by the marauding forces of agnosticism, trouble, and despair, then strikes God's hour to break in with His salvation. As far as I see it, it's a perfect environment for God to be at work. It's no uphill task for the Lord. Therefore, let these Samaritans clear the fog of spiritual defeatism. Let us reject the lying voices that insinuate ours is an unproductive hour for the proclamation of our faith. No doubt, people will reject. They'll mock us. They'll be offended. But you don't know who will bend the knee to Christ. You have no way of knowing that. Faith is possible. I think the Samaritans teach us that. What about the disciples? Well, from them we learn that faith is pressing. The discussion between Jesus and the disciples makes this point. Like the disciples, our approach is earthly. Yet four months, then comes the harvest. It's an earthly approach. But Jesus gives us a challenge. Lift up your eyes. See, the fields are white for harvest. In the physical realm, we can determine the days until harvest. But in the spiritual realm, we have no way of knowing. We cannot determine what God is working in the hearts of men. We have no way of discerning what seeds have been sown. We're not privy to the way God's working in the hearts of our neighbors. You have no idea what's happened in the life of your neighbor, in their heart. Therefore, our task is simply to speak of our Savior. And whether we reap or we sow, we rejoice together. The Samaritans, we learn that faith is possible. From the disciples, we learn that faith is pressing. And then my final point is this. From the Samaritan woman, we learn that faith has two parts. Two parts. One cognitive and one experiential. I guess it's really four, but, you know, putting two into one there. Faith has two parts. It's cognitive and experiential. First, the woman must be able to correctly identify who Jesus is. From a theological perspective, there's a, there's a doctrinal expectation where the world speaks of faith in general. Jude 3 speaks of uh, specific faith, right? We talk about faith. We're talking about the faith that was once for all delivered to the saints, the Christian faith. Speaking generally, we understand faith to be, Hebrews 11.1 1 says, the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. It's an adequate general kind of definition of faith. But we find out later in the book of Hebrews, Christian faith finds both this assurance and its conviction in Jesus Christ, who is the founder and perfecter of our faith. We must understand Jesus is not a mound of clay that can be molded to whatever we like. Jesus was a historical person. He came with a specific purpose and a specific message. We don't get to make it up. It's our task to search Him out in the Scriptures. What did we read last week in John 4, 24? What does it say? God is spirit and those who worship Him how? In spirit and in truth. It's a requirement. And so, faith has two parts. One, cognitive. We have to get Jesus right. It has to be the true Jesus. But another part of it is experiential. 
There's an experience. Now, I believe it's possible to understand the Christian faith and, you might say, have no faith. I think that's possible. It's possible that one can study the historical Jesus and never come upon the truth, never really come upon the truth. It's possible to have the correct theology, to be doctrinally sound and orthodox, to use all those fancy words, and yet have never tasted the water that Jesus offers. You might say we miss it by what? Twelve inches. This reality that Christ must be experienced raises the question, and this is the challenge, how? How do we experience Jesus? How do we have an experience with someone that lived 2,000 years ago? How am I supposed to do that? I don't think that's an easy question. Of course, some people say you can't. Historical Jesus is, is buried in history. I don't know, that's what the Discovery Channel says. Something like that. As you might expect, it's my conviction that he's not. (laughs) I believe that there's strong evidence that Jesus really existed. And I believe that there's strong evidence that the Bible is what it says it is. You can search those things out. I believe that Jesus and the Bible can weather any challenge. It can stand up to that criticism. And there's nothing wrong with searching those things out. That being said... When I think about the Samaritan woman, think about this story, these portraits, it's not how she came to faith. As the woman stood in the presence of Christ, something happened. Something changed in her. She wasn't tasked to go study the Bible and find out a bunch of details and do research. As good as that is, it's not what Jesus told her to do. She was changed in a moment. I was thinking about what Paul wrote in 2 Corinthians 4, 6. For God who said, let light shine out of darkness, that creating power, let light shine out of darkness, has shone in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God, where? In the face of Jesus Christ. That creative power, the power to create, to change a heart, to give new life, to renew, that that she could drink the living waters, shown in her hearts, shown in her heart as she looked at the face of Jesus, standing in his presence, was changed. She had an experience. God didn't lay out a convincing argument for the historical Jesus. He didn't tell her the Bible was true or authoritative, although it is. As that woman gazed into the eyes of Jesus, something beautiful happened. And here's how we awaken the experiential dimension of faith. Look at Jesus, which is what we've been trying to do for these weeks. Just look at Jesus. Open the pages of Scripture and stare at Him. Don't turn away. Don't close your eyes. With your eyes wide open, take in the full portrait of Jesus, the Savior of the world. Amen?